And we also have uh, some copies around the, the meeting room here this evening. But just before we start in with our welcome remarks, I am Amy Swag. I'm the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer in Minnesota. And we are conducting, this is our first hybrid meeting. So we have both um, review board and the public joining us uh, virtually, but we also have people in, in the room that will be introduced shortly. Uh, but I do want to just mention that the State Review Board is conducting this meeting uh, virtually under the Minnesota Statute 13D. There are a few um, rules or guidance that we want to uh, make sure that we're following because we are doing a remote or virtual meeting. And that's essentially because we want to make sure that all the members participating can be and can be heard uh, by others as well. We want to make sure that the members that are participating can uh, hear everyone and hear the conversation and be heard as well. And the other uh, last piece is that for the state review board, uh, when they are taking a vote, that the vote is done through a roll call. So those are the main uh, things that we're following this evening as far as the state review board goes. So with that, I will um, turn this over to President Larson to begin. Hello, my relatives. It's good that you're here today. Uh, welcome you here to Lower Sioux, what we call this area historically. And we're happy to be able to host your first in person since the pandemic. And want to just, on behalf of the council and all of our people here at Lower Sioux, welcome. Thank you for being here. Commissioner Davis, Roberts Davis. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Amy said, I am Alice Roberts Davis. I'm the commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Administration and the State Historic Preservation Officer for the state of Minnesota. And this evening, on behalf of Governor Walls, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, the SHPO team, and myself, I want to give sincere thanks to President Larson and the Tribal Council of the Lower Sioux Indian Community for hosting this review meeting for the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, as you know, we're gathered tonight to uh, hear, discuss, and review historical nominations, but you may not know that we are also involved in history because our joint meeting is an historical event all its own, being the first review meeting for a National Register nomination anywhere in the nation held in partnership between a Tribal Historic Preservation Office and a State Historic Preservation Office with review by the Tribal Council and the State Historic Preservation Review Board. So we should be very proud of that. The nomination is an update for the Lower Sioux Agency Historic District, which was originally listed in 1970. And the update presents an expanded boundary with greater representation of the cultural landscape, archeological resources, and most importantly, the expanded recognition of the district's significance in Dakota history. The historic district boundaries encompass both Lower Sioux Tribal and state lands, which brings us together for tonight's presentation and consideration. Uh, again, President Larson and members of the Tribal Council, we'd like to thank you and we look forward to continued collaboration long after tonight's historic meeting. Thanks everyone for being here. Good evening, my name is Lindsay Dyer and I am the chair of the uh, State Review Board. Um, prior to the uh, State Review Board giving introductions, I would love for the uh, President Larson and the team in the room to, um, I'd love to invite them to uh, share if they would like any sorts of introductions. We'd love to hear who's there. If someone's speaking, I can't hear. I, I don't know if you have the audio going. Thank you. Can we hear? All right. 
I'll be talking yeah. up you again. <laughs> Relatives. The Kote Ya, the Kanke, the Chop Kao Kao, me, I don't. The Kancha, Chanshayapi, the Mie. My Dakota name, as I was saying, literally takes more than a day to get the meaning of. But the very short elevator version is rolling bowl. And I was told that I need to do that introduction. Uh, when there's, you have that herd and that main bull, that lead bull, they see trouble coming. They gather the herd and face that storm. If the storm is what the trouble is, everything passes. They look back and see that everything is survived and is okay. Is when that bull would be like wallowing and kicking up dirt in celebration. So that's the very, very short version of my name. Uh, carry that from my great uncle, <laughs> young bear. And I am president of the Lower Sioux Indian Community, also chair of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. I'm a Prescott, uh, Lower Sioux Drop of Council. Francis, is <laughs> well, Joey O'Brien, uh, Chicago Council Secretary. Thank you, Robert. John Robertson, site manager for the Lower Sioux Historic Site, um, and a uh, member of the system, Lofton Oyate. Living in the community for over 40 years. Um, and uh, my initial stop when I was hitchhiking through was at the Lower Sioux Agency to visit my great great grandfather's grave was behind the agency here. So my history goes many directions and, and many places uh, with this site and other things. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Cheyenne St. John. I serve as the PHPO here at Chantre Appy. It's really great to see you all. Um, thank you for logging on the virtual audience. I um, look forward to the discussion today and welcome to those of you who have traveled in to be here today. Great, thank you. And Chair Dyer, um, before before we jump into board introductions, I want to make sure that we also uh, introduce the staff, the, the ship of staff that are here. So we'll do that. We'll do that um, quickly. Um, I have already introduced myself, but I'm going to hand it off to Assistant Commissioner Yoakum. Assistant uh, Commissioner Kurt Yoakum uh, with the Department of Administration. And one of my duties is that I work with the City Historic Preservation Office team. Um, I'm John Fisher. I'm the I was Shippo. I'm the Grants and Communications Manager, and also running the board. So to speak here today. <laughs> and I'm David Mather. I'm the National Register Archaeologist. Great. We've got a couple of virtual uh, staff as well, Jenny. Hi, I'm Jenny Way, the National Register Architectural Historian. This evening. I am Michelle Decker, and I am the admin for the National Register team. Thanks, everyone. Okay, Chair Dyer. Thank you. Are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Great. So, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Lindsay Dyer. I'm currently the chair of the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Review Board. I would like to invite the members of the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Review Board to introduce themselves, and we will do that alphabetically by roll call. I will start with uh, Board Member Anderson. Everyone, I'm Board Member Anderson. I'm one of the architectural historians in the group, and I am a professor of art and design at Augsburg University, where I teach art history and architectural history. Board Member Gladhill. Hi, I'm Bethany Gladhill. I'm a member at large, uh, recently elected. I work as a historic preservation consultant, and I'm really excited to be at the meeting tonight. Thank you. Board member James. Hello, everyone. My name is Elliot James. I'm assistant professor of history at University of Minnesota Morris, and I am one of the historians on the board. Um, next, we have board member Koski, who I believe isn't able to join tonight. Unless he did pop in. No. All right. Um, next, we have board member Lavasser.
Board member Lavasser, if you're speaking, I can't hear you. Are you able to unmute? Yeah. Hello. There you go. Can you hear me, hear me now? Yep. Yep. You're good. Okay. Um, Andrea Lavasser, I am a, a prehistoric archaeologist on the board, and I am retired uh, from the Chippewa National Forest and um, uh, where I was the uh, Forest archaeologist and uh, heritage program manager, and, and I'm up in Bemidji, Minnesota. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think my buttons are working quite right here, so I don't know if you have video of me or not because my my little box is black. But we can't see you, but we can certainly hear you. So right, that'll good. work for now. Thank you. All right, board member Mann. Hi, my name is uh, Rob Mann, and I am a professor of anthropology at St. Cloud State University, and I am the historical archaeologist on the board. Thank you. Board member Olson. Hi, my name is Steve Olson. I am a civil engineer, and I am a member at large on the board. Board member Sanders. I'm a uh, 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 a board member at large, and and I'm uh, retired from the Minnesota Historic Society. I was the former site manager at Jeffers Petroglyphs, and uh, I'm an archaeologist. Board member Shilke. Oh, you're on mute. Good evening. Can you hear me now? I'm yep. sorry about that. I'm Chris Schulke. I'm a uh, executive director of the Otter Tail County Historical Society, headquartered in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. I'm a public historian, historian, and a member at large. Board member Solomonson. Hi everyone. I am Kate Solomonson. I'm a professor of architectural history in the School of Architecture at the University of Minnesota, and I'm one of the architectural historians on the State Review Board. Board member Stark. Hi, I'm John Stark. I'm a practicing architect in Minneapolis and kind of specializing in historical buildings. And I'm on the board, a historic architect. Uh, board member White. Board member White. Board member White was going to call in, but he may not have made it yet. We'll keep an eye out. Um, that brings me to um, board member Worc Worcester. Tell me if I said that correctly. So Worcester. <laughs> Worcester, thank Worcester, you. Like the city in Massachusetts, yep. Uh, I'm Mike Worcester. I'm the executive director of the Morrison County Historical Society in Little Falls, and I'm one of the historians on the board of review. Thank you. So I am um, board member chair Dyer, Lindsay Dyer, and I am a member at large. Um, I currently work at the His uh, Minnesota Historical Society as the uh, yeah, the state capital and sites art program specialist. So with that, thank you for introducing yourself. Um, I would like to, at this point, um, pass it along to the tribal council to address um, their role. Um, I believe Cheyenne, Looking for you. Uh, well, you guys met our tribal council. We're happy to have you all here today. Um, following the uh, the outline of the agenda, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first uh, designation, our updated designation for the Lower Sweet Historic Site. Um, Co-presenting um, with David Mathers is myself and John Robertson. So we will go ahead and jump into our presentation. Um, we have uh, close to about two dozen slides. We'll move through rather quick. Um, Dave will be presenting. I'll interject as well as John in certain areas. So uh, thank you all again for your patience and uh, we look forward to answering any questions you may have after that presentation. I think um, as goes with the virtual platform, if you do have questions, if there's a little hand that can be raised, um, our, our tech savvy fella here will go ahead and address that. So thank you all. Go ahead, David. 
We want to have a shared diary uh, read first. Uh, if we do have a little bit of oh, just uh, kind of the intro of the National Register program and the role, if, if everyone's okay with that before we jump into the presentation. Uh, Chair Dyer, do you want to talk a little bit about just the role and what we're all doing here this evening? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll give a narrative of um, of the, the board's purpose, um, which is familiar to many, but new for some. So. Uh, the State Review Board's purpose this evening is to consider the nomination of properties to the National Register of Historic Places. As most of you know, the National Register of Historic Places is the nation's list of those places deemed worthy of preservation. A nomination form has been completed for the property that will be considered tonight. The nomination form has been sent to both boards, and each member has had an opportunity to study it prior to this meeting. The owners of nominated properties, local officials, and interested local groups have been notified of this meeting. All have been invited to send written comments about the nomination and to attend the meeting. Specific criteria have been established by federal regulation for evaluating each nomination to the National Register of Historic Places. Copies of the criteria have been sent to owners of the nominated properties and to the other parties mentioned earlier. A description of the National Register of Historic Places program has also been sent to them. These criteria are the standards by which the nomination will be evaluated. This evaluation is the State Review Board's only assignment. Should this nomination update be determined this evening to meet the criteria for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places, the nomination will be forwarded to the Tribal and State Historic Preservation Officers. Should they agree that the property meets the criteria and that the nomination is in proper form, they will sign the nomination and forward it to the National Register of Historic Places Office in Washington, D.C., where it will be reviewed once more. The process is a lengthy one, but it is calculated to subject each property to rigorous evaluation. So at this point, um, we are entering into the presentation um, of the nomination with some instruction. So for the, for the nomination this evening, we are going to use the following format. There will be a joint staff presentation of the nomination, followed by a summary of correspondence received. At that point, I will then invite and call on those who would like to speak about the specific property. We ask that you use the chat function or if you, unable, if you are unable to access the chat, raise your hand to indicate that you wish to speak. Please do not use the chat function for any other purpose. For those wishing to speak, we'd ask that you keep your comments to three minutes. We encourage comments to address the question of whether the property meets the criteria of significance for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. These criteria are the standards against which the review board will evaluate the nominations. This evaluation is the board's only assignment. Participants are invited to comment. Please keep in mind the three minute time limit for each speaker. People will be called on in the order they requested to speak or if that staff noted or, or when that staff noted their hand. Please unmute yourself, turn on your camera if available and state your name when you are invited to speak. After the public comment, the board will discuss the nomination. Our nomination this evening is Lower Sioux Agency Historic District in Redwood County, presented by David Mather and Cheyenne St. John. So now I would like to pass it on to Cheyenne and David. Thank you. This nomin the nomination to be heard at this joint national register review meeting is for Lower Sioux Agency Historic District in Redwood County. Dr. Michelle Tiro is the nomination author. She is the principal archaeologist and historian at Two Pine Resource Group in Schaefer, Minnesota. Preparation of the nomination was funded by the Minnesota Department of Transportation as part of the treatment of adverse effects for reconstruction of County State Aid Highway 2 through the southern edge of the historic district. Lower Sioux Agency was originally listed in the National Register of Historic Places on September 22nd, 1970. This was very early in the program. 
and the parameters that are so familiar to us today, such as the four criteria, have not yet been developed. Or the listing is entered in the SHPO database under criterion A at the state level of significance. Features of the historic property mentioned in the nomination by John Grossman included the Stone Agency warehouse and a series of granite commemorative markers. Lower Sioux Agency was a principal, was a principal location where the U.S. Dakota War began in August 1862, and this was the focus of the original National Register of the State. The nomination also mentioned that the Lower Sioux Agency historic site was then under development by the Minnesota Historical Society. The updated documentation that the Travel Council and Board are here tonight presents Lower Sioux Agency as a historic district that includes multiple contributing elements. It also presents an expanded boundary, part of which is within the jurisdiction of the Lower Sioux Indian Community Travel Historic Preservation Office, and part of which is outside that boundary of the jurisdiction of the state. As the TIPO and SHPO are peers within the Federal Historic Preservation Program administered by the National Park Service, we both need to review and consider the updated documentation and boundary increase, and that is the purpose of this joint meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes. People are having difficulty hearing um, uh, on virtually, uh, so I don't know if you're able to project a little more or okay. come closer to the, the, to the center. Yeah. Um, the microphone's not connected to the... Yeah, there's plenty of cord. Let's move the table up. One moment. <laughs> I am great. Thank, Thank you, Cheyenne. And then I think if you share your screen, the folks virtually will be able to see it because the other way they can't see this. Was oh, it not shared now? Oh, well, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. try that. Okay. I apologize, everyone. I thought I I thought I was already shared. But here's the just a image from the original listing in 1970. And a brief summary of that. Is, is the volume okay now? Much better. Okay, sounds good. So briefly, here's a comparison to the 1970 National Register boundary on the left with the currently proposed expansion, expansion which encompasses 241.11 acres. The new boundary incorporates the findings of archaeological investigations conducted in the late 1960s, 70s, 90s, and 2010s, and importantly, includes a greater representation of the Dakota cultural landscape, spanning the uplands and floodplain at the southern side of the Minnesota River Valley. Contributing elements within the, the historic district include the stone warehouse and archaeological remains of other buildings and other archaeological features from the agency period which lasted from 1853 to 1862. Also contributing are a cemetery and a separate burial, a mound, and aspects of the historic transportation network, including roads and the ferry crossing at the Minnesota River. These resources are elements of the cultural landscape encompassing the uplands, bluffs, and the wooded floodplain. Also contributing to the district are a series of granite markers dating to 1898, which represent an early effort at historical commemoration and, and interpretation in Minnesota. As an example of the landscape and vegetation that left, we see restored prairie to the south, to the south of um, County Road 2. Camera here is facing west. Uh, and this is at the western edge of the historic district. At the right, the James W. Lynn burial marker is in the foreground with a view to the southwest. It is surrounded by prairie grass, and behind that, deciduous trees are, are visible that are also within the historic district along the edge of the river valley. Um, the, this marker is one of the six interpretive and memorial markers from 1898. Lower Sioux Agency was established after the Treaty of 1851, which is one in a series of major changes for the Dakota, requiring them to give up ancestral homelands and traditional ways of living. The government wanted tribes to shift to settled life and agriculture. As such, the, ag the agency was established in 18 1853 to provide training and to distribute annuity payments, food, and supplies as promised by the treaties and much needed due to the loss of traditional food sources. 
The U.S. government did not honor the terms of these treaties, however, for example, by withholding annuity payments and by reducing the size of the reservation along the Minnesota River after families had already moved to the Lower Sioux. The stone warehouse was, con was constructed in 1861 and is the primary element of the built environment remaining from the period of significance. Uh, the photos here illustrate the continued historical integrity of the building from the late 19th century when it was part of a farm to the original National Register listing in 1970 and to its condition today. The view is east, northeast in each photo. The Episcopal, Episcopal Mission Church of St. John the Evangelist was under construction when the U.S. Dakota War began in 1862, and its foundations are preserved as an archaeological feature near traces of several other buildings and an historic road segment. These historical images are from October or November 1862. The sketches are by Albert Colgrave. A cemetery and burial mound are also present in this part of the district. The mound is likely older from the woodland tradition, perhaps centuries and millennia before, but it was also part of the cultural landscape of the agency period and is therefore a contributing element of the district. Archaeological investigations were conducted related to proposed um, County Road 2 reconstruction from 2012 to 2014, documenting a remarkable array of intact features, including building and fence remnants related to the agency. There are also archaeological features related to military reoccupation of the agency as Camp Sibley following the war in 1862. Other archaeological components in this area represent uh, pre contact Native American presence in the district thousands of years ago in the archaic and woodland traditions. The photos present examples of 19th century archaeological features. At left are three slit latrine features shown after excavation with camera facing northeast. At right is an archaeological remnant of a burnt structure with charred timber and a stove pipe section in place with view to the north. Cumulative archaeological investigations have been intensive in some areas of the historic district, including related to rest restoration work around the stone warehouse and um, around the, the Episcopal Church Foundation, and more recently, as just mentioned, related to the county road reconstruction. Collectively, these studies have, have identified that the archaeological components of Lower Sioux Agency are extensive, well-preserved, and complex. This view is supported by archaeological surveys for trails at the historic site in the 1990s, where additional agency era archaeological features were identified. Working from historical records and archaeological investigations, a series of thematic contexts or complexes for the district were proposed in the 1970s and further developed during the recent investigations and preparation of this nomination update. These include a Native American complex that represents 19th century Dakota residences and daily life throughout the district. The other complex is related to the government and administration of the agency, traders' operations, agriculture, and religion are more geographically defined. There's Joe. Cheyenne. Thank you, David. Uh, before we get into some of the more contemporary investments from the tribe and explain the partnership, I wanted to insert this slide just to show some of the uh, over within the last decade, Lower Sioux Indian community has invested capacity and funding to share a broader Minnesota history at this site and within the district. Uh, we have included highlighting our partnership with the Minnesota Historical Society and becoming a more present and visible partner to where we are today, which is reclaiming a significant Dakota landscape. Thank you. Also here on the slide is examples of some of that representation that is uh, that can be found throughout the historic site district. Um, you'll see the increased presence of our Dakota language, uh, more primary voices uh, being interpreted through the signage of, of storytelling, um, updated signs, and um, exterior components to uh, guide visitors through through the uh, through the site. So um, the, the 
period of significance for the historic district dates from the establishment of the agency in 1853 to the aftermath of the U.S. Dakota War in 1862. There is a separate period of significance for the early interpretive markers that were established in 1898. The historic district is significant under National Register criteria A and B at the state level in the areas of Native American history, military, politics and government, and archaeology. In the conclusion of the original National Register nomination in 1970, John Grossman wrote that the Lower Sioux Agency illustrates the failure of 19th century Americans to reach a just ar arrangement with the Native tribes. This sentiment is still relevant when reflecting on the historic district today. The mid 19th century was a difficult and tumultuous period for the Dakota, who had to give up most of their ancestral homelands and traditional lifestyle in response to treaties that were then not honored by the United States government. The Lower Sioux Agency Historic District conveys the story of that time and its dire consequences in the short term for the Dakota and for the state of Minnesota as a whole, but it is also a testament to the resiliency and determination of the Dakota both at that time and in the periods ever since. I wanted to take this time to impress all those that our discussion focuses on a specific location, which is the historic site. Um, the Videwa Kanawa and Dakota have a far reaching relationship with the adjacent landscapes of the agency. And we are grateful through this updated nomination that audiences of Minnesota will further their understanding of our deep rooted connection and relationship to this area that we call Tanashayaki. So the illustration that you're looking at is um, was completed in partnership with Blue Pine Resource Group, and it's a cultural resource map of Chanchayaki as we know it here um, in our community. Uh, the Kasat Q report identifies within the historic district an arcade site, of which Minnesota only holds a handful. Uh, we have we reaffirm what our ancestors have shared many times that there has always been a long standing indigenous presence in Chanchayaki. Unfortunately, many tribal nations are at the whim of archaeology and historic records to justify their presence and habitation. Here at Lower Sioux, we look forward to the opportunity to share and expand this narrative through our own historic findings and redesigning a narrative that represents our perspectives. Here is a map of uh, Red Deer County. Uh, this is uh, complements of the Office of State Archaeology. So you will um, see the, the different Squares, rectangles that identify historic properties, historic sites, and um, I apologize, I didn't get a chance to circle the lower the agency, but it's in there. And it's in there. Uh, this is uh, the, the river valley and the representation of historic um, properties and cultural resource sites in our area. In an effort to educate and preserve our, our culture, our office and many others look beyond archaeology to archaeology and historic records to justify and acknowledge our significant site. Uh, we remember our Dakota principles and worldviews such as Wasi, which means all my relations, and Kokamani, which represents above as below. And so with some of those concepts in mind, um, our offices, THPOs, look beyond borders and medicine lines to discover a broader understanding of our history. And so this map represents here two sites that are significant within our area of Minnesota. You'll see the bottom yellow pins there, but we look beyond that into the states of South Dakota, Montana, all of these um, migrational areas, uh, historic migration areas, and we understand that it's not just the landscape that tells us a story, but also um, the cosmology and how these relationships are connected to a much broader history and um, way of knowing.
and uh, thank you all. And uh, we have no um, correspondence related to this nomination. Thank you. Um, so now we begin the public comment portion of this nomination. And I would like to invite um, those who are in person at Lower Sioux to um, to make any comments or um, invite discussion. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment about how um, thankful I am to see the updated nomination be more representative of the landscape rather than uh, just just that to, to see the landscape um, more broadly represented through this update. So thank you. Thank you. Are there further comments from the tribal council? Or, or from folks that, that are joining from the public there? I can't tell how many are in the room. So if not, I would love to um, open up comments uh, to folks that may have asked so, oh, for chat or John, are there any other folks that would like to make a comment from the public? So if not, um, oh, was there something? No, it was just Jenny saying, we can't hear you, John, if you spoke. <laughs> that was no raised hands. <laughs> no raised hands. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, board member Wor Worcester, did you have a comment? Uh, just a quick question. Um, I noticed it was... Um, it was not noted for national or federal significance. Was there a reason for that? Thank you. Oh, you mean the, the area of significance? The nomination. Right. Is it the, is the state level of significance? Is that what the question is? The question is, was there a reason why it was also not noted as being federal or national significance? Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It, the the evaluation both in the seventies and and now has been in the basically in the context of the state. Although you know certainly the you know the agency and the war of eighteen sixty two had had broader implications than that. It, when something is going to be um, nominated at the national level of significance, the the historic context statement and the you know the evaluation really. Um, is done at a national level, um, and so you know it's always possible that that could be done later. But at this point, it's been done at the state level. Okay, thank you. So, as the public comment section is now closed, um, I would love to uh, invite before we move into the voting process to, uh, for the tribal council and the SHPO staff uh, board. Um, to have a joint discussion. And so I would like to invite um, if any members of the tribal council or state review board, if they have any comments regarding this nomination, uh, this is your time. Um, if you'd like to make a comment, please uh, state your name. Um, looks like board member Stark. Hi, John Stark, board member Stark here. Um, one of the reasons I enjoy being on this committee is being able to read these things. And I thought this was really well written and gave a description of the area, um, as someone else had mentioned, um, that the people and what happened both sides, um, it was very factual and it, it was interesting to know what was going on here. Um, it really helps me to understand this. I'm sure it will be a great record for it. I've driven through this area a number of times um, 
having a project down in Redwood Falls. So um, it helps explain the landscape of what I was seeing around there and the, the markers on the side of the road and not understanding exactly what was happening in that area. So thank you. Thank you. I see in the chat that uh, President Larson would like to speak. Maybe on mute if you're speaking. Still no audio. Can you hear us? Test. Test screen. Can you hear? Okay. We're good. All right. Uh, just wanted to take a vote of our council publicly to support or deny this application. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? With the quorum here, we support this nomination. Um, so my process is that we now move into the State Historic Preservation um, Review Board vote, um, unless we have any other comments um, from SHPO staff. Otherwise, I will move right into that. Okay. So um, I would like to request from the Review Board if there is a motion regarding this nomination. Uh, yes, board member Solomonson. You're on, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I would like to make a motion to recommend that the deputy state historic preservation officer approve the nomination for listing in the national register of historic places. Thank you. Is there a 2nd. Board member Schulte 2nd. Thank you. It is moved and seconded. We will now begin the roll call for this nomination. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. Board member Anderson. Aye. Board member Gladhill. Aye. Board member James. Aye. Board member Lavasser. Aye. Board member Mann. Aye. Board member Olson. Aye. Board member Sanders. Aye. Board member Schulke. Aye. Board member Solomonson. Aye. Board member Stark. Aye. And do we have board member White? Okay, board member Worcester. Aye. And chair votes aye. Thank you, everyone. So um, this concludes the presentation of nominations in the joint meeting. Um, at this point, I would like to invite um, members of the Tribal Council if you would like to make any final comments. President Larson here, I just would like to say thank you to Damia for everybody's hard work on this and dedication seeing it through and everybody's comments and support Thank you. All right. Thank you, President Larson. Um, so at this point, we will have a five minute recess and we'll reconvene for the remainder of the state review board agenda. We have four additional nominations. Um, so at this point, let's ask for I would like a motion from either body to adjourn the meeting. Is there, right. is there Board no member Schulke adjourned. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so this concludes this concludes the joint meeting for the Lower Sioux Indian Community Tribal Council and the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Review Board. Thank you, everyone. Um, the time is 646. We will reconvene at um, 647 now. We'll reconvene at 650.
uh, two. See you back at 6.52, thank you.
It's now 652. We'll just give a minute for folks in the room to uh, reconvene. Thank you. John, is this better for sound? I hear I'm really loud in the room, so I can't I can't tell if this is better. I did turn it down. Okay. Great. Um, all right, we're going to uh, get started again if everybody's ready in the room. Yeah. So uh, the second meeting um, will be a standalone meeting. So we will go through the um, the regular uh, introductions uh, that we have at normal um, board meetings. Um, so I will start off by saying good evening and welcome. Um, so this meeting uh, to this meeting of the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Review Board for the National Register of Historic Places. My name is Lindsay Dyer. I'm currently the chair of the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Review Board. Our purpose this evening is to consider the nomination of properties to the National Register of Historic Places. As most of you know, the National Register of Historic Places is a federal list of those places deemed worthy of preservation. A nomination form has, get, has been completed for each of the properties that will be considered tonight. The nomination form has been sent to the review board members and each member has had an opportunity to study it prior to this meeting. The owners of nominated properties, local officials, and interested local groups have been notified of this meeting. All have been invited to send written comments about the nomination and to attend the meeting. Some of you may wish to speak this evening about a particular property. You are welcome to do so and I encourage you to address yourself to the question of whether that property meets the criteria established by the National Register of Historic Places. These criteria are the standards by which the review board will evaluate the nominations. This evaluation is the board's only assignment. These criteria have been established by federal regulation. Copies of the criteria have been sent to owners of the nominated properties and to other parties I mentioned earlier. A description of the National Register of Historic Places program has also been sent to them. Each of the nominations will be presented by a staff member. Persons viewing the meeting remotely will be then given an opportunity to comment. These comments should be limited to three minutes. The Minnesota State Historic Preservation Review Board will then discuss the nomination and a vote by the board will follow. Should a nomination be determined this evening to meet the criteria for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places, the nomination will be forwarded to the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer, Amy Spong. Should she agree that the property meets the criteria and the nomination is in proper form, she will sign the nomination and forward it to the National Register of Historic Places Office in Washington, D.C., where it will be reviewed once more. 
The process is a lengthy one, but it is calculated to subject each property to rigorous evaluation. Before we begin, I would like the members of the Minnesota State Preservation Review Board to introduce themselves, briefly stating the role they fill on the review board and their particular expertise. Thank you. We will start uh, the roll call with board member Anderson. Hi, I'm Kristen Anderson. I'm one of the architectural historians and I'm a professor in the art and design department at Augsburg University where I teach art history and architectural history. Thank you. Um, board member Gladhill. Hi, I'm Bethany Gladhill. I'm a member at large on the review board and I'm a historic preservation consultant. Board member James. Hello, my name is Elliot James. I'm assistant professor of history at University of Minnesota Morris, and I'm one of the historians on the board. Board member Lavasser. Hi, I'm Andrea Lavasser. I am the prehistoric archaeologist on the board, and I am retired from uh, Chippewa National Forest, where I was the forest archaeologist and heritage program manager. Uh, board member Mann. Hi, I'm uh, Rob Mann. I am a professor of anthropology at St. Cloud State University, and I am the historical archaeologist on the board. Good board member Olson. Hi, my name is Steve Olson. I am a practicing civil engineer and a member at large on the board. Uh, board member Sanders. My, my name is Tom Sanders. I'm the, uh, a board member at large and I'm an archaeologist. Uh, board member Schilke. Hi, Chris Schilke. I'm the executive director of the Otter Tail County Historical Society and I am a at large historian. Board member Solomonson. Hello, I'm Kate Solomonson. I'm an architectural historian on the board, and I teach architectural history in the School of Architecture at the University of Minnesota. Board member Stark. Hi, I'm John Stark. I'm a historic architect on the board, and I'm a practicing architect in Minneapolis. Board member Worcester. Sorry, I had to unmute. Mike Worcester, I'm the executive director of the Morrison County Historical Society in Little Falls, and I am one of the historians on the board. Thank you. Um, so I am board member uh, Chair Lindsay Dyer, and I am a member at large, and I work with the Minnesota Historical Society at Capital and Sites as Capital and Sites Art Specialist. So thank you for introducing yourselves. Uh, we would now like to hear from Deputy Amy Spong and the SHPO staff regarding any updates. Can you all hear? How about now? Can you hear? That's better. Thank you, Amy. Trying to speak up a little bit. Just a couple announcements before we kick up the second part of the meeting. Uh, we have our uh, same uh, SHPO team and we were still joined, uh, which is wonderful, by our commissioner, Alice Roberts Davis, uh, who also serves as a SHPO officer. We have Kurt Yoakum, who's our assistant commissioner, works with uh, the SHPO uh, office and division. And then we have David Mather here, our National Register archaeologist, and John Disher, our communications manager, and who's also monitoring um, this meeting this evening and helping with the technology. And then virtually we have Ginny Way, our National Register architectural historian, and Michelle Decker, our administrative uh, assistant, who's recording and um, taking minutes for the meeting this evening. Uh, and the only other um, announcement that I didn't get to mention the first time in the first part of the meeting is that I think it's very fitting that we're having some of these really important nominations be heard and considered during this month, uh, the month of May, because it is National Historic Preservation Month. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out to everyone. And the theme this year is people saving places. So 
If anyone has a chance to participate, there's a lot of different activities going on across the state, um, various tours, and um, if anyone has a chance to, to participate, I would encourage that. But you all are participating in Preservation Month by uh, the work that you do, the volunteer work that you do. Uh, so I just want to extend that thank you to everyone um, on the board uh, and for making a difference and for promoting and advocating for historic and cultural resources. So, uh, National Register team, does anyone have any announcements, updates? Amy, may I add one? Absolutely. Commissioner? Uh, excuse me, this is Assistant Commissioner Curry Open. Uh, uh, if you don't mind that, if you're, if I just jump in for a second. I'd also like to mention that uh, our State Historic Preservation Officer, Commissioner Roberts Davis, uh, after four years, this will be her last State Historic Preservation Review Board meeting. She'll be moving on to the University of Minnesota, where we'll probably uh, uh, come across her in a few different roles interacting with this committee, but she's been a big champion of SHPO for the last four years. And as she was letting me know before this meeting, when she first came into her role as Commissioner of Administration, one of the first items that she worked on was a, a land transfer with the uh, Lower Sioux Agency and said to uh, come here tonight and be uh, here. She mentioned it kind of comes full circle. So I just wanted to acknowledge that this will be her last meeting here. Thank you. And thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Okay, Chair Dyer. Thank you, Amy. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, the review of the minutes from the February 7th, 2023 meeting. Are there any corrections to the distributed minutes? If there are no corrections, uh, could I have a motion to approve the minutes? There's a hand raise. I can't quite see it. Uh, this is board member Godhill and I'm moved to approve the minutes. Wonderful. Uh, is there a second? Board member Worcester seconds. Uh, we will begin the roll call to approve the minutes. Board member Anderson. Aye. Board member Gladhill. Aye. Board member James. Aye. Board member Lavasser. Aye. Board member Mann. Aye. Board member Olson. Aye. Board member Sanders. Aye. Board member Schulke. Uh, board member Schulke, are you muted? Sorry. Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Um, board member Solomonson. Aye. Board member Stark. Aye. And uh, board member Wor Worcester. Aye. Uh, Chair votes aye. Uh, minutes have been approved. Thank you, everyone. So now we uh, move on to the presentation of nominations with some instruction. For each nomination this evening, we are going to use the following format. There will be a staff presentation of the nomination, followed by a summary of correspondence received. At that point, I will then invite and call on those who would like to speak about the specific property. We ask that you use the chat function, or if you are unable to access the chat, raise your hand to indicate that you wish to speak. Please do not use the chat function for any other purpose. Those wishing to speak, we'd ask that you keep your comments to three minutes. We encourage comments to address the question of whether the property meets the criteria of significance for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. These criteria are the, are the standards against which the review board will evaluate the nominations. This evaluation is the board's only assignment. Participants are invited to comment. Please keep in mind the three minute time limit for each speaker. People will be called on in the order that they requested to speak or that staff noted their hand. Please unmute yourself, turn on your camera, and state your name when you are invited to speak. After the public comment, the board will discuss the nomination. 
So our first nomination this evening is Mini Owe Snee, Coldwater Spring in Hennepin and Ramsey counties, presented by David Mather. This is a concurrent federal and state nomination. After David's presentation, there will also be presentations by Frankie Jackson on behalf of the Tribal Leaders Task Force and Dan Ott for the National Park Service. Thank you. We don't have sound yet if you've started speaking. Thank you. You're going to have to project your voice. Okay. Yes. <laughs> We're just moving the owl. All right, thank you, John. Is that better? Board members on online? Yeah, thank you. Yes, this first nomination is for Mani Oisni, Coldwater Spring in Hennepin and Ramsey County. The nomination authors are Frankie Jackson of the Sisseton Wapton Oyate and Dan Ott of the National Park Service. This nomination is for a traditional cultural place significant to the Dakota. It is also the first time in Minnesota's National Register program that we've had a concurrent federal and state nomination. The National Re Register listing process is different for federal land, and Minnesota has a good range of federal listings. Examples include Pipestone and Grand Portage National Monuments, the Gold Lake Mounds and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Gold Lake Recreation Area, and the Rabidou CCC Camp in Chippewa National Forest. Concurrent nominations are when the nominated property is partly on federal land and partly on land under the jurisdiction of the state. And this is the case for Minio Westney in the Twin Cities. The spring itself became part of the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area in 2010, which is a unit of the National Park Service. Um, the T um, excuse me. Um, this TCP includes the creek that flows through the uh, flows to the Mississippi River. And this crosses through non-federal land administered by the Minnesota Historical Society. After tonight's consideration by the State Review Board, the nomination will be returned to the federal agency for final review and pending approvals submitted by them to the keeper of the National Register for listing. SHPO's role in a concurrent nomination applies to the non-federal portion of the historic property. On the right is a federal land survey showing ownership. The spring itself is within the large parcel of federal land on the west labeled Coldwater Spring. The creek flows to the east and southeast through the non-federal Minnesota Historical Society parcel before entering the Mississippi River. The easternmost federally owned parcel labeled Island 108 is form was formerly an island in the river and is still part of Ramsey County, while the rest of the historic property is within unorganized Hennepin County within the former Fort Snelling Military Reservation. After acquisition of the property surrounding the spring by the National Park Service, Vacant buildings from the mid-20th century Federal Bureau of Mines facility were removed. An ongoing program of landscape restoration was initiated in 2013 to remove invasive species and to restore and maintain the native ecology of prairie, oak savanna, and hardwood forest. This effort includes habitat improvement and reintroduction of culturally significant native plants that were selected in collaboration with tribal subject matter experts and park biologists to further complete the natural and cultural restoration of the area. Some of these species are listed on the right by their Dakota and their English names. Located near the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers, the Neo is an important natural spring associated with Medote and, and is therefore connected to, to Dakota cosmology and traditional cultural practices. It is the best preserved and most accessible of the springs around Bedote, which many consider to be the Dakota place of origin, and it is an integral part of that sacred cultural landscape, including its role in the passage of important water deities from the rivers to the uplands. Water from the spring remains important in Dakota ceremonial use today. While the spring's traditional cultural significance to the Dakota remained constant throughout the impacts of the 19th and 20th centuries, 
the landscape restoration efforts have significantly enhanced the historical integrity of the setting. Here is a view of the spring, camera facing west with the, with the water that was once confined to a culvert now flowing free and surrounded by prairie veg vegetation. The late 19th century stone spring house relates to former use of the spring as a fresh water source for Fort Snelling. The area of this nomination overlaps with a portion of the previously listed Fort Snelling Historic District. However, the structures of the spring house and reservoir are not contributing within the context of the site as a traditional cultural place where the focus of significance is the spring itself, along with its waterway and surrounding landscape features. At left, we see the spring as it emerges from the ground within the spring house viewed as to the northwest. And at right is the water as it spills into the reservoir camera facing west. After leaving the reservoir, Coldwater Creek flows four tenths of a mile to the south and southeast before joining the Mississippi River. The creek ranges in width from one to five feet and is, and about, is about one foot deep. It drops about 50 feet off the bluff into the floodplain. At left is a view of the creek flowing through the bluff top basin, camera facing northwest. Center top, the, the creek approaching the fall over the bluff edge, camera facing east. And at right, the creek cutting through the stone bluff edge with a view to the west. At left, we see the creek as it flows across the Mississippi River floodplain, view to north. And at right is the creek entering the Mississippi River at a time of low water and the camera here is facing south. Manio Esti is somewhat unusual among um, historic properties in that its protection is specifically required under Minnesota state law. A 2001 amendment to the Minnesota Historic Sites Act, Chapter 138.665, added language that specifies protection of the natural flow of water to and from Coldwater Spring as well as state review of projects in regard to the water flow. Many OECD has been determined to be historically and culturally significant by sovereign tribal nations, including the Lower Sioux Indian Community, the Shakopee, Medawakan, and Sioux Community, the Upper Sioux Community, and the Prairie Island Indian Community. The spring's eligibility for the National Register as a TCP was established in an ethnographic study that documented the importance of the site to the Dakota on the basis of 19th century written records and oral history, as well as testimony from present day native elders about the spring's ongoing significance. Additionally, it has been declared to be a sacred site under federal executive order 13007 by the Crow Creek Sioux tribe, the Flandreau Santee Sioux tribe and the Lower Sioux Indian community. The period of traditional cultural significance for the property is not measurable in calendar years. It begins with the concept of time immemorial and continues through the present day. The level of significance is local. The property is significant under National Register criteria A and C in the area of Native American history. Crucially, after two centuries of landscape alteration and urban development surrounding Bedote, Manio Isni remains as, remains as one of the few places where Dakota people can connect with a significant spring associated with the story of their creation as well as collect ceremonial waters within that same sacred landscape. Minio Isni is the best, pres best preserved and accessible of the natural springs around the area of Medote at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. Oral history from Dakota elders and written records from the 19th century attest to the cultural significance of water for the, from this spring for ceremonial use. This nomination has been a cooperative effort from the four Dakota tribes in Minnesota and the National Park Service. Supporting that effort is the opinion of the SHPO that listing of Manio Isni or Coldwater Spring in the National Register would be an important step forward for historic preservation in Minnesota. Correspondence related to this nomination includes letters of support from the Tribal Leaders Task Force, excuse me, Task Force signed by the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers of Upper Sioux Community, Lower Sioux Indian Community, and Prairie Island Indian Community, and from the Chairman of the Shakopee, Medawakan, and Sioux Community. There is also a letter of support from the Minnesota Historical Society. And now, because this is a concurrent nomination, we have statements from Frankie Jackson on behalf of the Tribal Leaders Task Force and from Dan Ott on behalf of the National Park Service. Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Mather. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me okay? Oh, 
like to start by thanking the Lower Sioux Tribal Council for hosting this historic meeting in partnership with the State Historic Preservation Review Board. I would also like to thank my co-author, Dr. Dan Ott, for his leadership and willingness to work with members and tribal representatives from the four Dakota communities throughout this nomination process. I would also like to acknowledge the leadership of Superintendent Mr. Blythe, who has supported these efforts and it's through his leadership um, that the process is moving forward. Additionally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Michelle Terrell from Two Pines Resource Group for their valuable contributions by way of ethnographic research and documentation. Michelle and her associates' efforts to document oral testimonies from treasured elders about the historical and cultural importance of Mani Oweshni to the Dakota Oyate will continue to be a major contribution for researchers and scholars alike. I would like to thank my fellow members of the Tribal Leader Task Force for their leadership and advocacy of this nomination. Through guidance from Mr. Leonard Wabashaw, Mr. Noah White, Madam Cheyenne St. John, and Madam Samantha Odegaard, this nomination reflects Dakota Wichoma, or our Dakota way of life, and our continued connection to Mani Oweshni. I further like to thank the elected officials and tribal representatives from the Shakopee, Madei Wakankawa community, the Prairie Island Indian community, the Lower Sioux Indian community, and the Upper Sioux Indian community. The struggle to accurately define why Mani Oweshni is important to Dakota people and our life ways has spanned well over two decades. And so it's only fitting to recognize those I believe we've lost video and sound from the room. People we'll just give them a minute to get back up and running. Okay, now you're back. Yep. As such, the unique perspectives of tribal people can help inform planning and help determine future management contributions, such as what we are proposing at Manio Wishti. This is because tribes bring forward a wealth of knowledge and a depth of understanding of the landscapes and resources to which their cultures are connected. This knowledge comes from generations of interconnectedness with the landscape and its resources. Relying on such knowledge is valid and vital. Through it, we can create a framework that leads us to improved outcomes for understanding and protections of places of importance within our great state of Minnesota. The evaluation of properties for National Register eligibility involves an assessment of the significance of a property in terms of its historic and relevance to the geographic location and area in question. In other words, we are building context that will help us better understand the landscape that is important to Dakota people. As noted in register in the National Register Bulletin 15, the significance of a historic property can be judged only when it's evaluated within its historical context. Historical context are those patterns, themes, and trends in history by which a specific occurrence, property, or site is understood and its meaning within history or prehistory is made clear. Bulletin 15 directs that the concept of historical context help to shape and define and explain these elements that are fundamental to the study and the understanding of history. Through the use and acceptance of oral documentation, the significance of historic properties rests on the premises that resources, properties, and events in history do not, occur, do not occur in a vacuum, but rather are part of a larger trend of patterns in history. And accepting oral history through this nomination, you board are validating the voices of elders who have come before me 
elders who have spoken on the historical significance of this place long before I came into existence. And so I thank you for taking into consideration the voices of our elders who are no longer here. And I thank you for your job and duty for recognizing and amplifying those voices of our treasured elders. Thank you. Um, thank you, Frankie. I would like to begin by thanking my co-author, Frankie Jackson, for his patience and willingness to collaborate with me and as we work together to sensitively, accurately, and authentically describe the code of ways of knowing many a ways to meet within the confines of the seemingly rigid National Register of Historic Ways and Criteria. Additionally, I would like to thank the members of the Tribal Leaders Task Force for advocating for this nomination to move forward, as well as providing the National Park Service with valuable information regarding the site and thoughtful feedback during the review process. I can truly say that working with Leonard Wabashas, Cheyenne St. John, Samantha Odegaard, and Noah White on this nomination as representatives of their respective nations has been one of the great highlights of my career. Uh, I'd further like to acknowledge staff at the National Park Service Keeper's Office, the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Office, and the Minnesota Historical Society for their kind and technical feedback and their support of the nomination. Uh, finally, I'd like to recognize decision makers within my agency, both at the park, like Superintendent Tucker Blythe, and the region for being supportive of the collaboration. Uh, this nomination is the result of a quarter century of advocacy for Venezuela by Dakota people seeking to protect their culturally, to protect this culturally important spring, as well as to have their history and cultural ways of knowing recognized by the federal government. What began as activism by individuals and groups of Dakota citizens was continued by appointed representatives of sovereign tribal nations, first separately and more recently in concert as the Dakota Tribal Leaders Task Force. Throughout that time, Dakota individuals, leaders, experts, and appointed government representatives have resiliently advocated for the cultural significance of Coldwater Spring, despite an enduring and daunting bureaucratic structure that was reluctant to recognize Dakota oral history or a larger cultural sense of place within the purview of the National Register program. That this traditional cultural property nomination is moving forward is a credit to their commitment to making the federal government understand the significance of many away as a special place worthy of protection and collaborative co-stewardship. As a historian of the National Park Service, it has been a pleasure to work on this project. I believe that it is important to note that as the federal government's leading historic preservation agency and a land management entity, Realizing opportunities to recognize tribal values and oral histories within the National Park Service stewardship mission is not difficult. We are not building highways, industrial complexes, or pipelines. We are managing ecosystems, lands, and waters, as well as protecting our nation's shared heritage. Our mission is compatible with tribal values and tribal histories provided we choose to focus less on authoritative decision-making and project completion and more on meaningful dialogue and inclusive processes. Such important work makes our agency relevant to the American people in the 21st century and is but a small step towards better fulfilling the federal government's tribal trust responsibility to sovereign nations and indigenous peoples. Uh, with that, I'd like to conclude by thanking the State Review Board for your time and considering this uh, this nomination, as well as for the lower to the lower Sioux Indian community for hosting uh, us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will now enter into the public comments portion of this nomination. Is there anybody who is waiting to speak? Amy, did you say something? I do not see anybody on chat who has asked to speak. Um, is there anybody else, John? I'm not sure if I'm, Amy, if you're speaking, I'm not sure if I'm hearing you.
to turn my should I unmute? Okay, yeah. no, I hear you now. Okay, there, there seems to be a big delay for some reason um, in the in the sound here. But I, I this is a uh, Amy Spong. I did want to add that in the chat. We have a, a thank you note to Mr. Jackson and all the Dakota Tippos in Minnesota, and that is from Sarah Childers from Flandreau Santi Sioux Tippo. So I just wanted to make sure everybody could see that. That's all. Okay. Um, if there aren't any other public comments or any public comments, we can. Um, Close the, the comment period. Uh, at this point, I would love to ask the board members if there is a motion regarding this nomination. Well, You're raising a hand. I can't I can't see the hand. Board so members speak up. will make that motion. You? I would like to make a motion to recommend that the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer approve the nomination for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Thank you, Board Member Schulte. Is there a second? This is Board Member Solomonson, and I would like to second the nom uh, second the motion. Thank you. It is moved and seconded. Is there any discussion related to this nomination? Uh, board member Stark, I see your hand up. On mute. Um, yeah, I had the opportunity yesterday afternoon to go walk through the site, trying to better understand what was there. And it's, it's, I recommend everyone get a chance to do that. It's really close and easy to get to. My question, maybe it goes to David Mather. Um, I understand what's going on. I'm really supportive of this, but just uh, my background comes from buildings. And when you have non-contributing and contributing, and I'm a little torn by that because it feels like I'm walking into an abandoned and late 19th century uh, site uh, uh, with the, the uh, spring house there and the pond and the retaining wall and everything else. And there's a, a walks around there. Is, is it more, what happened here, the history of it, and any archaeological stuff on the surface, there's, I question some of that stuff. If you could clarify that, and, and it kind of goes back to when we had the golf course, um, and we would had that discussion in a previous meeting. Yeah, the, um, yeah the, the significance of the traditional cultural place here is focused on the spring and the water itself and the landscape that it flows through. Yeah, there are historic um, structural remains. There are archaeological sites, and they may be, um, you know, significant for other reasons. That, and some of them are uh, recognized in the Fort Snelling Historic District National Register documentation. But but this uh, this historic property, this nomination, focuses on the on the the cultural landscape features themselves, and it it, it is a you know, a standard thing for national register boundaries to overlap. Sometimes like an individual place will be listed within within a larger district that may or may not be directly related. Um, you know, the, the boundaries are can be, you know, they're all their own thing, whether they overlap with one another or not. And Frankie or Dan, do you want to speak to that question at all or? I mean, I just want to follow up on what David said, and essentially that there is, you are correct, John, that there are uh, remnants uh, from the 1880s on the site of the waterworks at Fort Snelling, uh, but also that that those remnants are, are on top of a landscape that is significant to Dakota people uh, since time immemorial for a variety of cultural, cosmological, and traditional purposes. And so those that those two things are intermixing um, does not hinder the nomination in any way. Okay, thank you very much. I see a hand from uh, Board Member Olson. Thanks. I, I've got a, a few things. Um, I guess one is 
Yeah, I, I get the comment made earlier that it was trying to sort of shoehorn a site that doesn't neatly fit into uh, a national register form. Um, and the imagery, it'd be, you know, from one perspective, I'd like imagery that wasn't sort of Fort Snellingized, if you will, as sort of the lead image, if it was a little more natural. I don't know if that's possible, but um, two other things. As a, as a civil engineer, the flow of water is important to me too. And the nomination talks about how important water is to people. Is there a reason why the boundary for the district centers on the border of the land instead of in the river is one question. And then related to that is, you know, what would be the best thing to take care of the resource going forward? And so Island 108 was an island previously in its best preservation mode. Would it be returned to an island? Um, and like things like the wing dams come out of the river, but those are far reaching questions down the road. Um, my 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 bigger question, I guess, is sort of related to John's about the significance. And so criterion A is is really simple for me to understand for this property. Criterion C is harder for me to, and it seems like it's hanging on some of the last verbiage in criterion C. And if David or others could help me understand the criterion C piece of it, it would help me. Thank you. Significance is, is not related to engineering or architecture like we most often see criteria C. It's because of, of this. But individual landscape elements like the spring, the, the creek, the, you know, the vegetation, the, the topography. And so I, I'm trying, I'm struggling to come up with, to remember the exact verbiage of that part of Criterion C. Um, it's the, the, it's Criterion C4, so it's separated off in the National yep, Register yep. Bulletin, right? Yeah. And essentially it's a representative element that yep. is on their own do not, rep, that are not significant, but are part of a larger whole that is significant. Yes. And so. The reason why we use that criteria is that it's part of the larger whole of springs, which Dakota people recognize as being significant in the Badote the Badote area. Mm -hmm. um, you have, I have a follow up on the boundary question. If, if oh, please go ahead. The follow up on the boundary question is that generally speaking, within Dakota ways of knowing, um, there are not necessarily clear spatial and property boundaries to find the sites of significance. Um, but within the National Register criteria. You do need to have owner consent to list a property. And so we've pragmatically decided that we were going to list those pieces of property where we could get uh, owner consent uh, with relative ease. And so that's why you see uh, the National Park Service lands and the uh, Minnesota Historical Society lands as part of that. I think undoubtedly, if you were to ask members of the Tribal Leaders Task Force, it would include. Uh, VA lands, it would include MnDOT lands, it would include a variety of other pieces along the river, who owns the, the river, you know, Army Corps, all sorts of different landowners. And so it was a pragmatic decision in the interest of seeing the property listed rather than a, than a clear reflection of um, Dakota ways of understanding, understanding landscape. Yeah, I would say also within the you know, National Register program, the boundary as proposed is is consistent throughout in terms of historical integrity um, the landscape, the setting, feeling and association are are much better represented in that boundary. And it also includes then then the surrounding urban environment. And it also contains the outlet of the spring itself, as well as the, the creek to the Mississippi, as you said, John, the the yeah, you know, the Mississippi River is a bigger question. Um, you know, the you know, in our discussions, we wondered a bit about, you know, the, you know, kind of the the aquifer that feeds the spring as well. That's not that's not um, terribly well defined. It presumably goes outside this area, but we really couldn't think of a way to encompass that. But this, in terms of the 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 ground surface, the landscape surface, um, does have um, consistent and well preserved historical integrity. 
And there's just a lot of unknowns with regards to you know future activities going on with the dams coming down and things like that. Though there are some early discussions with our tribal leaders on what that part of the river may look like, it's too early and speculative for us to even comment. So I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, are, are there any other comments to be made? Okay, so the motion before the board is to recommend that the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer approve the nomination for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. So those in favor say aye, those opposed say no. We'll vote uh, by roll call. Um, board member Anderson. Aye. Board member Gladhill. Aye. Board member James. Aye. Board member Lavasser. Aye. Board member Mann. Aye. Board member Olson. Aye. Board member Sanders. Aye. Board member Schulke. Aye. Board member Solomonson. Aye. Board member Stark. Aye. Board member Worcester. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you, everyone. Now we will be moving on to our next nomination. Our second nomination this evening is Hey Mini. Sean Barn Bluff in Red Wing, presented by David Mather. This National Register update for uh, Hey Medicia Barn Bluff was prepared by Michelle Terrell and Ava Terrell of Two Pines Resource Group and was funded by a, uh, through a federal historic preservation fund certified by the city of Red Wing. That effort was part of a long term restoration and management plan that included restoration of the Carlson Line Kill Kiln Ruin and preparation of a cultural landscape report for Barn Bluff, funded with the Minnesota Historical and Cultural Heritage Grant awarded uh, in 2014. Part of the, the Legacy Amendment Arts and well, this is part, of, part of the Legacy Amendment Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Also contributing to this effort is a series of cooperative projects. Between the city of Red Wing and, Fer and the Prairie Island Indian community to restore the landscape through the removal of invasive species, interpretation of cultural history, or Dakota cultural history, and creation of a new park management plan. This National Register update is for Hayman H. Barn Bluff, but it actually addresses two previously listed properties. Barn Bluff was originally listed in the National Register on August 3rd, 1990, under the English name alone. It was one of two properties nominated by Carol Zelli from a triple sponsored statewide survey of culturally significant landscape, uh, natural landscape features, and one of five that were recommended as eligible. Previously, the GA Carlson Line Kiln Ruin was listed in the National Register on September 27, 1976, under criteria A and C. The boundary of Barnes Bluff listed in 1990 was defined by the 740 foot contour on the USGS topographic map. The currently proposed boundary encompasses the topography of the entire bluff and includes the Carlson Line Kiln, which was reconstructed into the base of the bluff. The Dakota name for the bluff, Hey Manicha, means hill, water, and wood. <laughs> Explorers around 1700 called it LaGrange, and this is the source of the English name Barn Bluff. Prior to the Treaty of 1851 and subsequent development of um, the city of Red Wing, a better walk in Dakota village of several hundred people and about 22 lodges was located next to a spring fed creek at the base of the bluff. The origin of the land form is accounted in Dakota oral history and its cultural significance is reflected in continued cultural traditions today. Very among the top of the bluff are among the contributing elements in the historic district. At left are images from the park master plan and new interpretive signs highlighting Dakota history developed in partnership by the city of Red Wing and the Prairie Island Indian community. 
at right is the view of the NHS by block camera facing the left. Historical images provide a record of the lost continuity of appearance and high integrity of setting, appearance, feeling, and association. At left is an 1856 watercolor by Edward Whitefield showing wood, the wooded north face, expansive prairie, and historic bedrock. At right is an 1875 photographic view of Barn Bluffs on the Mississippi River. For as long as the bluff has been a public space, people have wanted to get to the top. The first formal effort to provide access was construction of the Citizens Memorial Stairway in 1929. Most of the stairway was lost, however, in the late 1950s when the west end of the bluff was removed during construction of a new bridge across the Mississippi River. As can be seen in the two images, the upper, upper bluff face and summit are still intact despite this disturbance. Since the early 20th century, at least, trail development has provided access to the top of the bluff. The circulation system is a contributing element of the historic district, and one of the oldest trails is the Prairie Trail running east to west along the, the bluff top. At left is a view of prairie vegetation on the south slope below the Prairie Trail, camera facing west, and at right is the same trail, camera facing east toward the east overlook and the edge of the bluff. The bluff top of Hay Manicha reaches about 340 feet above the surrounding terrain, rewarding hikers with incredible landscape views of the Mississippi River and Red Lake. These views themselves are contributing elements of the historic district. At left, the view from the left overlook of the camera facing west, southwest, and at right is the French panoramic map of Red Lake, Minnesota, as drawn from the west overlook by George Richards and published in 1874. And here's a comparison of the historic and current views looking east downriver from the east overlook atop Hamanicha. At left, a stereoscope image from around 1880. And at right is the current view from the east overlook, camera facing east. Other than the power plant in the foreground, the configuration of river channels, bluff lines, and railroads are unchanged. Before development of the bluff as a park, it was forage for lime. Uh, Line production from the 1870s into the beginning of the 20th century. At left is a view of the Carlson Lime Kiln ruin in uh, 1976 from the original National Register nomination. At right is the current condition following recent stabilization and restoration. Camera facing southwest. The Carlson Lime Kiln was the most obvious remnant of that period of history, but it was part of an extensive network of quarries and kilns. Lime production was economically important in the 19th century, but opposition by the city of, of Redwood, the citizens of Redwood, eventually stopped the lime operations here out of concerns regarding the damage they were doing to the bluff. Archaeological remnants of the industrial lime production are among the contributing elements of the historic district. At right is a view of the G.I. Carlton Red Wing Pioneer Lime Works around 1890, camera facing southeast. You can recognize the stone face of what is now the ruin rising up between or behind the, the white facade. At left of the GA Carlton quarries at the east end of the bluff around 1895. The period of significant states from the year 900, when American Indian traditions of mound building were prevalent in the Red Wing area through 1939, which was the culmination of the movement to preserve the bluff as a public park. As with the original listing in 1990, the area of significance is local. The district is significant under National Register criteria A and B in the areas of exploration, settlement, uh, entertainment and recreation, archaeology, Native American heritage, and industry. Amanicha Farm Bluff is one of the most distinct and well known cultural landscape features of the Upper Mississippi River. Its listing in 1990 was an important step forward for the National Register Program in Minnesota, and it is fitting today to see that expanded to include the bluff significance of native history, as well as the interdisciplinary recognition of archaeology, the built environment, and the connection with this prominent natural landmark. Uh, there is no correspondence to this nomination. Uh, Amanicha Farm is there anyone who has signed up to speak for the public comments portion? Yeah, no one, nobody has signed up to speak 
Okay. I do not see anyone in the chat. Um, if you are a member of the public who would like to speak, now is your time. Okay, I don't see any hands. So, um, at this point, I would love to ask uh, the board if there is a motion regarding this nomination. This is board member Gladhill. I would like to make a motion to recommend that the deputy state historic preservation office approve the nomination for listing in the national register of historic places. You yeah. is there a 2nd? Yes, this is board member Solomonson and I'd like to 2nd it. Yeah, it is moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion from the board related to the nomination? Um, board member Worcester. Thank you. Thank you, madam chair. I, I, this is probably going to get filed under. There's nothing we can do about it, but, um. This site sits right next to a very active rail line, correct? Yes, it does. Okay. Is there any concern at all about the potential increase in tra increase in traffic due to the recent merger between CP rail and Kansas city Southern? Again, probably nothing we can do about it, but is that. Are there any concerns about that at all? Um, yeah, good question. I have not heard of such concerns so far. I do know um, that during the, the most recent bridge replacement, which you know, occurred a few years ago, there was um, you know, part of that process was monitoring vibrations and other potential effects to the bluff. Um, if there is concern about additional rail or increased rail traffic, it's possible that that sort of measure could be taken as well. I don't know what the process to do that would be, however. Okay, thank you. Board member man. Uh, yeah, hi, I had a, a quick question about the non contributing resources especially the um, East 3rd Street neighborhood. And maybe if I could just hear a little bit uh, more about uh, that neighborhood, for example, uh, who lived here and, and were they quarry workers or um, limestone kiln workers? Were they related to the, the industry that, were, that was going on on the bluff? And then a little bit more perhaps about um, uh, even though it seems there are some intact deposits and features, why it was considered non-contributing. Good. Excellent question. Thank you. Um, yeah, my understanding is that the, the neighborhood was, was um, you know, a former neighborhood of the city and is non-contributing because it is unrelated to the, um, you know, the archaeological aspects that are on the, the, the bluff itself. Um, I cannot answer the question about um, whether workers live there. I believe the authors might be here, um, and perhaps if, if they're able to answer that question, Michelle or Ava Tara. I thought I thought I saw this Michelle. Yeah, this is Michelle. Hi. Um, hello, everyone. Michelle Tara with Two Pines Resource Group. I um, would have to, it's been a bit since I've submitted the nomination, I would have to dig a little deeper, but as I recall, that neighborhood was developed uh, not concurrently with the uh, lime quarry industry on the bluff and was demolished in the 50s. And so I do, do not believe that there was related resources to the features that the bluff is nominated for. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for that. I, I really did appreciate this nomination. I've, I've driven a past the bluff, but I haven't had a chance to uh, to explore yet. But after reading this, I certainly will next time I'm uh, down that way. Thank you, Michelle. I, I would... Thank you. Um, 
Oh, are there any other comments or questions from the board? Please raise your hand or pop it in the chat. I heard something from the room. Uh, David, was there more commentary from the room to share? I don't hear anything. So if um, we're ready to uh, uh, take the roll call, um, the motion before the board is to recommend that the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer approves the nomination for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. So uh, we will vote by roll call. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. Uh, Board Member Anderson. Aye. aye. Board Member Gladhill. Aye. aye. Board Member James. Aye. Board Member Lavasser. Aye. Board Member Mann. Aye. Board Member Olson. Aye. Board Member Sanders. Aye. Board Member Schulke. Aye. Board Member Solomonson. Aye. Board Member Stark. Aye. Board Member Worcester. Aye. Uh, chair votes aye. Thank you, everybody. So now we will be moving on to our next nomination. Our third nomination this evening is Lake Park Banshell in Winona, Winona County, presented by Jimmy Way. So hey, this, oh, is, this okay. is Michelle. Um, Jenny, uh, her computer kind of froze up and she has to leave and come back in. So she's having a few technical issues. Jenny, we see you. You made it back on. Um, when you're ready, we are ready for you. Great. I did. <laughs> are you, can you hear Thank and you. see me? Yes. Yes. But we're I'm not presenting yet. Okay. I am at the office. So the fact that I lost Wi Fi connection is fascinating. I'm working on sharing now. Please bear with me. All right. Okay, I think I got it. Wonderful. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chair Dyer. Um, this nomination tonight is the Lake Park Band Shell in Winona, Winona County. The author is Greg Gout. This nomination was made possible by funding through the Minnesota Histo Historical and Cultural Heritage Grants. The Lake Park Band Shell is located north of Lake Winona within the circular drive formed by Park Drive on the north 
and Lake Park Drive on the south. West of the bandshell is an audience seating area composed of metal benches arrayed in a wide arch around an oval-shaped grassy area. West of the seating area is a parking lot designed to allow audience members to hear concerts from their cars. The bandshell is a stilted, spherical half dome that has an outside diameter of roughly 42 feet. The stilted half dome is set on a concrete platform roughly 42 inches above grade. A wide stilted Roman arch frames the open end of the dome. At right is the front or west facade of the bandshell, camera facing southeast. At left is a photo of the dedication of the Lake Park bandshell in, on June 15, 1924. The Winona Park Board began to explore creating a park around Lake Winona in 1900. In 1905, they began proceedings to take shore land by eminent domain. The board then hired O.C. Simmons, a Chicago landscape architect, to draw up plans for a stable lakeshore and surrounding parklands. Lake Park needed a bandstand because Winona, like all Midwestern towns of the era, had an active musical culture. The musicians needed places to play. However, it was the formation of the Winona Municipal Band which made the construction of a substantial permanent bandshell a priority. At left, we see the rear or east facade of the bandshell, camera facing west. At right is the south facade, camera facing northwest. The first concert of the Winona Municipal Band took place on August 9, 1915. Several thousand people came to hear the band play on a makeshift bandstand. Despite the popularity of the entertainment, the park board had difficulty securing the funding for a, for a formal bandstand. The onset of World War, 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 excuse me, World War I also led to significant delays in construction. It wasn't until 1923 that they were able to move forward with the project. At left is the north facade, camera facing south. At right is a photo of construction taken in the fall of 1923. In spring of 1923, the park board hired Edwin Clark from Chicago arch architectural firm of Clark and Walcott to design the band shell. Clark is designed the structure with a classical revival detailing. This included engaged columns and pilasters, as well as classically inspired niches. At left is a detail of paired engaged columns on the northern stilt of the arch, camera facing east. At the center is a photo of the 1954 Memorial Day observance of, at the bandshell. And at right is the detail of an alcove of the northern stilt of the arch, camera facing north. The Winona Municipal Band presented its first regular summer concert in the new band shell on June 25, 1924. From that point on, they, they presented regular summer concerts at the band shell, usually on Wednesday nights, which continue to present day. At left is the band shell seating, camera facing west. At right is the storage room below the stage, camera facing north. The period of significance for this property is 1924 to 1973. The level of significance is local. The National Register criteria are A and C. The areas of significance are entertainment, recreation, and architecture. The period of significance begins in 1924 when the band shell was completed and dedicated and ends in 1973, 50 years from today's date in accordance with the National Park Service guidelines. From 1924 until present day, the Lake Park band shell has been the city of Winona's pr prime outdoor venue for music, including concerts by the Winona Municipal Band. It is also a distinctive example of the classical revival style as applied to band shells. For these reasons, the Lake Park band shell is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. There is no correspondence related to this property. Hey, Jenny. You're welcome. Um, is, is anyone uh, interested in making a public comment on this nomination? Do not see anyone waiting in chat. John, is there anybody else that you can see has maybe called in or? No, no, we've got nobody waiting to speak. Oh, wait, did you have a question? Yeah, so we have a question from um, Commissioner Alice Roberts Davis. What were the alcoves used for? I don't know if Greg Gout is here. Um, Greg, were you able to attend this afternoon? Or this evening? 
Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, I, I really don't know what they were used for. I, I haven't didn't be able, wasn't able to find any historic photos that showed anything in those alcoves. There might have been something at some time, but there hasn't been anything for a long time. Thanks, Greg. We appreciate that. Any other comments? No. Okay. Um, uh, in order for the board to discuss, uh, may I have a motion regarding this nomination? Uh, board member Stark. Got to get this formal thing here. I would like to make a motion to recommend that the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer approve the nomination for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Is there a second? Remember Olson. I would like to second that. Wonderful. Um, are there any comments or questions from the board? Uh, board member Stark. You're, you're muted if you're speaking. Sorry, question for Greg. Okay. On the parking lot and the uh, seating area, it seems that that was a part of an original design. Is the layout that's currently there probably for the seating might be similar, but parking looks like it's expanded or changed? Yeah, so um, that area has actually gone through a lot of changes over the years. Uh, the, the seating was changed three different times. And um, I'm sure the parking lot is, is expanded also. I mean, one of the things that happened um, right to the um, to the west of the um, parking lot was there was a whole veterans memorial that was created, and so that was that was a part of a big change that happened there at the same time. I should say, John, that uh, this year, uh, you know, next year, 2024, the uh, city of Winona is going to have a big celebration celebrating the centennial of the band shell. And uh, they are committed to uh, doing a lot of work to prepare for that. So there'll there'll be some uh, upgrading of the band shell itself, uh, concrete repair, some some structural repair underneath, repainting it, and also upgrading the uh, uh, lighting and sound systems uh, to make it a better venue for musical performance. But they're also doing some independent fundraising uh, to try to uh, reconfigure the landscaping um, around the. Uh, uh, around the band shell and redoing the chairs or the seating arrangement. The seating is really has got to be changed. It's been changed three times and it needs to be changed again. And um, there's a talk about making that parking lot a little bit smaller uh, and having some other parking in other areas so there could be more uh, flexible seating, for room for people to bring their own uh, chairs like people like to do with these outdoor concerts. That's a little bit controversial in Winona because you may recall from the nomination that people in Winona like to come to the that the Winona band concerts and sit in their cars and then after each number honk their horns uh, in, in the place of applause. So they're gonna have to keep some places for people to do that, but not have quite as much uh, parking. It is a unique layout that seating would go right through the middle of the parking and and it's kind of like a drive-in band shell. Yeah, uh, exactly. That. And that looks historically what it was, which is, Interesting. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Yep. Do you have any other comments from the board? Please raise your hand. Last call. All right. Um, the motion before the board is to recommend that the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer approve the nomination for listing the National Register of Historic Places. Those in favor say aye, those opposed say no. Um, we will vote by roll call. Board Member Anderson. Aye. Board Member Gladhill. Aye. Board Member James. Aye. Board Member Lavasser. Aye. Board Member Mann. Aye. Board Member Olson. Aye. Board Member Sanders. Aye. Board Member Schulke. Aye. Board Member Solomonson. 
Aye. Board Member Stark? Aye. Board Member Worcester? Aye. And Chair votes aye. Thank you. Now we will be moving into our um, fourth and final nomination for this evening, which is the Tracy, Tracy Municipal Building in Armor and Armory in Tracy Lyon, Lyon County, presented by Jimmy Way. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think you unmuted me. Can you all hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you, Chair Dyer. This is the Tracy Municipal Building and Armory in Tracy, Lyon County. Lauren Anderson, New History, is the author. The Tracy Municipal Building and Armory is located in Lyon County, Minnesota, at the north edge of the community's downtown commercial district. The building fronts on Morgan Street, approximately 45 miles east of the Minnesota-South Dakota border. The building has a U-shaped footprint comprised of the original 1938 municipal building and the L-shaped 1958 armory addition. The 1938 building is a two-story, flat-roofed brick building, rectangular in plan. City offices, public service counter, and council chambers are located at the front of the building while a double height auditorium with a barrel vaulted roof is found at the rear. The building's primary entrance is defined by a modern style stone entrance portal. The adjacent to the portal are infilled overhead door openings, which were historically used by the city's fire department. At left is the south elevation of the municipal building and armory addition camera facing northwest. And at right is a circa 1970 view of the uh, similar view of the building. The 1958 Armory Edition is one is a one and two story flat roofed brick edition. It is joined to the west elevation of the municipal building by a double height auditorium extension. This construction campaign extended the original auditorium footprint approximately 85 feet to the west. The remainder of the modern style edition currently holds classrooms, offices, and support space, and historically served as the armory for Tracy's local unit of the National Guard. At left is the Tracy Municipal Building, circa 1960s. At right is the south and west elevations, uh, camera facing northeast. The original municipal building was constructed using Public Works Administration, or PWA, funding. The PWA was one of an extensive program of federal aid intended to promote economic recovery during the Great Depression. The focus of the PWA program was to encourage economic recovery by funding new construction projects. At left is the south elevation, camera facing north. At right is the west elevation of the armory addition, camera facing east. On August 24th, 1937, the city received the long anticipated allocation from the PWA. The drawings for the municipal building were finalized by architect Philip Charles, or PC, Bettenberg. The drawings indicate the building was designed to house the fire department, the public library, the city council chambers, the offices of the city clerk, and the municipal judge, as well as a large auditorium. At left is the firing range of the armory addition, camera facing northeast. At right is the first level city council chambers in the municipal building, camera facing southeast. In 19... The building, when constructed, consolidated the city's scattered municipal services into a single modern facility. The auditorium functioned as a community center, providing gatherings and event space for Tracy residences. At left is the lower level stair lo lobby of the municipal building, camera facing northwest. At right is the first level stair in the municipal building, camera facing southeast. Additionally, the building was utilized by the Tracy National Guard as early as 1947, when the local guard unit was established. It was not until the construction of the building's 1958 armory addition, however, that the guard received their own purpose-built space at the property. At left is the first level corridor in the municipal building, camera facing north. 
At right is the second level stair lobby in the municipal building, camera facing northeast. This unit, along with another in Marshall, Minnesota, represented the first two National Guard units ever established in Lyon County. Enrollment in the Tracy unit was opened in September of 1947 and was activated the next month with a total of 38 men. Enlistment continued to grow and the company enjoyed one of the best enlistment records in the Midwest. At left is the south elevation of the Armory Edition, camera facing north. At right is the first level corridor in the Armory Edition, camera facing west. Tracy City officials purchased the lot immediately to the west of the municipal building in 1948 in anticipation of armory construction. However, the National Guard believed the unit had sufficient space within the building and deprioritized funding for a new armory. At left is the first level auditorium looking into the original municipal building, camera facing northeast. At right is the first level auditorium looking into the 1958 edition, camera facing southwest. You can see the addition, where the addition um, and the original building meet at the line in the center where the, um, the ceiling structure, the roof structure changes. By July 1956, the National Guard's position had changed and plans for the auditorium and addition were drafted by the architectural firm of Bettenberg, Townsend and Stoll. The initial armory addition consisted of two components. The first one, the first was a one over two and two story wing with classroom offices and other guard facilities. And the second, a double height auditorium extension to the existing municipal building auditorium. At left is a second level meeting room in the municipal building camera facing west. At right is the mayoral office in the municipal building camera looking east. In addition to providing facilities for the National Guard, the auditorium expansion ensured that the municipal building continued to function as a community gathering space for the city. The Tracy National Guard continued to occupy the armory for the over three decades. At left is the second stair lobby at the armory addition, camera looking east. At right is the second level storage room in the municipal building, camera looking east. The Tracy Armory remained in operation until 1992 when the federal government directive to reduce National Guard strength resulted in the closure of Tracy's Armory, along with 11 others in Minnesota. That year, the city purchased the Armory Edition and reopened it as the Veterans Memorial Center, which today serves as a venue for sporting, community, and private events. At left are the stairs at the second level of the Armory Edition, camera looking east. At right is the second level classroom of the Armory Edition, camera looking west. Here are two additional exterior views. At left are the west and the north elevations of the Armory Edition, camera facing southeast. At right is the east and north eleva elevations of the auditorium, camera facing southwest. The period of significance for this property is 1938 to 1973. The level of significance is local. The National Register criterion is A. The areas of significance are entertainment and recreation, politics and government, and military. The period of significance begins with the municipal building construction in 1938 and ends in 1973, 50 years from today's date in accordance with National Park Service guidelines. The Tracy Municipal Building and Armory was the hub of municipal government and services and the Center for Community Recreation as well as the home of the local unit of the National Guard. For these reasons, the building is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. There is no correspondence related to this nomination. Any, are there any comments um, from the public regarding this nomination? Do, I do not see anybody waiting in the chat. Um, John, is there anybody else I should be waiting to hear from? No, no raised hands, nobody in the chat. <laughs> okay, great. Um, all right, so the public comment period is now closed. In order for the board to discuss, may I have a motion regarding this nomination? Great. 
for a motion from the board. Yeah, um, uh, board member Sanders. A, a motion to recommend that the deputy state historic preservation officer approve the nomination for uh, listing in the National Historic Registry of Historic Places. All right, is there a second? Board member Mann? Second. Uh, that's, all fine. that's fine. I think he got there first. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. Um, are there any questions or comments from the board? Yeah, board member Worcester. Um, two items. One is because I'm a, a stickler for grammar um, on it's page one of the figures. It says figure A. If you look on there, um, it's the, the caption is location and existing parcels of Tracy Municipal Norma, courtesy of Lyons County. I believe that should just be Lyon County. Figure if we're going to send this in for posterity, we should make sure we should we should probably make sure that that's spelled correctly. Then my other question is, and I'm sorry, but I am horrible that way, so you can hate me. No, if you not want. at all. So, <laughs> um, my other question is then it, on figure. I'm sorry, on photo eight of twenty three that you showed, which is it? Is it from a backside that we're looking at that? Um. Figure eight of twenty three. Yeah, I'm looking at the photo file, not the application itself. Sure. Does it happen to have a caption? Uh, yes. East and north elevations of municipal building camera face in southwest. Yes, that is the rear of the municipal building auditorium edition. Okay. So that so on the left side there on the image, are those windows that were filled in at some point? I would assume so. Lauren, are you on the call? I cannot recall the description. I would anticipate that those would have had. Um, I mean, that would have been typical of an armory building built in that style of which we've seen quite a few. They usually had large windows to let a lot of natural light in. Correct. This would have started off as the municipal side, um, but my guess is that that it would remain true um, in that way as well. Lauren, are you? Lauren is here. Do you remember if there was glazing in the historic photos, Lauren? Hello, um, I'm sorry if you could give me just a minute while I pull up that photo so I can yeah. make sure I'm I can referencing this. I can share my screen. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. No problem. So I, we are talking about this building on the right. This photo on the right. Yes, that's correct. Um, those openings would have originally had windows. Okay, so on the interior, they're no longer, uh, there wouldn't be windows there ever again, probably, probably not. At that's a good question. At the current time, I don't believe those are remaining, um, but I would need to double check. Okay, that's fine. Here. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board or comments? Yep, um, board member Stark. Yeah, um, I saw someplace in there because of the addition of the armory that is not eligible for um, depression era work program kind of stuff. But I, I also noticed that they mentioned, according to the Tracy Herald, um, the plans were revised several times in an effort to provide a structure that would blend with the municipal building. And I think they did a good job for a 1958 time period. It's Kind of unique to have that um, type of thing to blend in, um, so it it really does help. It'd be nice to see those infills and those cheap vinyl windows replaced, but that can happen. That can indeed. And board member Stark, we did consider um, listing the property under Criterion C, but the MPDF is very clear on the integrity requirements, and the addition was too large and too prominent for us to. To really feel like the the building fit under those, um, and there are not a whole lot of these out there, so we don't have a standard plan to compare it to with regard to whether or not it represents a a particular style or type of building. Right. I don't think that matters as far as what we're looking at here and nominating, but it, 
yeah, criteria wise, you have to follow that. Okay. Other comments from the board? Okay, um, the motion before the board is to approve, is to recommend that the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer approve the nomination for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Those in favor say aye, those opposed say no. We will now vote by roll call. Uh, Chair Member Anderson. Aye. Chair Member, uh, sorry, Board Member Gladhill. Aye. Board Member James. Aye. Board member Lavasser. Aye. Board member Mann. Aye. Board member Olson. Aye. Board member Sanders. Aye. Board member Schilke. Aye. Board member Solomonson. Aye. Board member Stark. Aye. Board member Worcester. Aye. Chair votes aye. So, uh, this concludes the presentation of nominations se uh, section of our meeting. Are there any additional business items to discuss from the SHPO staff or board members? Speaking on behalf of staff, we do have no additional, uh, in we have no additional things to discuss. Thank you. In that case, do we have a motion to adjourn? Board member Schulke, so moved. All right, thank you. This concludes the Minnesota State His uh, Historic Preservation Review Board meeting. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, y'all.